Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome to the CIFAR uh, seminar series for the developmental award uh, presentations. It is my pleasure to introduce today Dr. Rosina Cianelli, a PhD. She's a professor at the University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies, and she's also a visiting professor at the Universidad Católica de Chile in the nursing school. Dr. Cianelli has been recognized as a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, ambassador for the Friends of the National Institute of Nursing Research, and uh, she was also awarded with a fellowship from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the Executive Nurse Fellow Program. Dr. Cianelli is a PI of three funded studies uh, that focus on uh, promote PrEP for HIV prevention among rural Hispanic women, prevent chronic diseases among older Hispanic women and improve their, their quality of lives uh, among adults with chronic diseases. Uh, I am really, really happy to have her with us today because her scholarly work reflects a commitment to decreasing health disparities among vulnerable population, but primarily with a focus on HIV prevention among women, especially among minority women, as well as other uh, global health issues related to women's health. And she does work not only in the US, uh, very uh, important work that she's going to present today in Miami, but she also works in Chile, Haiti, and Mexico. Uh, so uh, today she will be presenting the results from her CIFAR administrative supplement, CEPA uh, PrEP, a promising HIV prevention strategy for cisgender Hispanic heterosexual women to access, initiate, and sustain use of PrEP. Thank you so much, Rosina, for uh, being with us today presenting and also for focusing your work on this important topic of HIV prevention for women. Thank you, Dr. Alcaide. So, uh, and thank you for being here for, for the presentation. Uh, our grant will officially finish on the December. So what I'm presenting are just some preliminary studies uh, results that we have. So I would like to introduce also to you our COI. We have, I'm sure that you know many of them, Dr. De Santis, Dr. Giovanna de Oliveira, Dr. Jose Castro, uh, Ms. Susan Rubio, who is the director of the community organization in Haunted. And you know, without her support, we, we really cannot access the, the rural community there. It's important also to highlight that we have been working with MUHER for almost 10 years. So for the reason it was not a difficult to create this liaison to work with them. Also, I have two uh, important research assistants from the PhD program at the School of Nursing, Evelyn Iriarte, who is a PhD candidate and who started with us working from the beginning of the project and Maria Jose Baeza, who just start with us um, this semester. So thank you to all of them. I also would like to, to express the team gratitude to CIFAR for the support that we received for this grant, especially Dr. Pawa and Dr. Maria Luis Alcaide, our CIFAR mentor, uh, and Dr. Deborah Jones, who helped us a lot during the application time. And of course, David Johnson for his patience with us. <laughs> I'm not going too much in the detail of the background of uh, our study, but as you know, 19% uh, of the diagnosis of HIV were for women in the US in 2016, and the number of women living with HIV that are Hispanic cisgender are 2.5 times higher than of non-Hispanic white women. So, Around 1.2 million Americans are eligible for PrEP, but only uh, from that group, 38% are women, but only 70, uh, seven, not 70, 7% of them are PrEP users. So it's, it's a disparity in relation with a PrEP user among women. And this disparity is bigger considering some racial or any minority as um, Hispanic. So our, our aim for, for this study was to develop 
a, a PrEP component that adapts SEPA intervention into SEPA PrEP for rural Spanish gender women, assess the feasibility acceptability of SEPA PrEP as an HIV prevention strategy, identify cultural behavior barriers and strategies to PrEP uptake relevant to rural cisgender Hispanic women, and identify community and healthcare barriers and strategies to increase and facilitate PrEP uptake among rural women. So that, just uh, an introduction about what SEPA is. SEPA is um, a culturally specific and theoretical based group intervention for Hispanic women to prevent HIV. SEPA was tested in two clinical trials to see the efficacy of this intervention and also it was tested the effectiveness of SEPA. Uh, so we really have a strong base intervention that SEPA that has been proved to help to decrease risk among Hispanic women. Um, we never use SEPA in, in rural community, so that's something new. And also SEPA does not incorporate anything related with PREP. So our idea was to really make SEPA into SEPA PREP specifically for Hispanic uh, rural community. So in our grant, we use the implementation science and we use also the community participatory uh, research. A little bit about the design, we collect qualitative and quantitative data. And the graphic here is as we design the initiation of the study. So we're PIs from the School of Nursing and uh, not PI from the School of Nursing and COIS also for the School of Nursing. And we have also Dr. Castro from the School of Medicine. So through Mujer, we connect with the Florida farm workers and the rural coalition, but was through Mujer. So the, our main contact during the grant was Mujer. I'm going to explain also what these two community did in terms of this grant. Also, we create a community advisory board. We interview healthcare providers. We run a focus group with 10 rural cisgender Hispanic women. And we are now assessing the feasibility and acceptability of the modified SEPA into SEPA PrEP. So we, we were really busy during the time that we create, a, we implement and we put the, the grant in the community. So at the beginning, we start talking with the three community organizations particularly um, Asociación Campesina or Frank Worker Association and uh, Grupo Amor, because they were invited to the grant, they will, will, will explain them, but at the moment of initiate the grant, there were a lot of discussion that we need to have. From that meeting, the first activity that we did was to create the community advisory board. So the three community suggest us who can be in this community advisory board. So the community advisory board is composed of 15 Hispanic women that live in the rural area of Homestead. We have been conducted with them a meeting, one per month, and we have two more pendings that we will do during October and uh, November. So the first thing that we find out in the, in the meeting with the community advisory board is that they really didn't have too much knowledge about PrEP. In the reality, not too much knowledge. This was the first time that they hear that PrEP exists. Also in the first meeting, we find out that there were a lot of uh, misconceptions or anticipating anticipating that they didn't know about HIV. So based on that, we designed a four hour training on HIV and PrEP. We also presented to them 
the original SEPA intervention. So this, this group of women, they are between 35 to 64 years old. They live in the US between uh, 12 years to 55 years. So they, they have been long in the, in the US. Five of them prefer to talk in Spanish. Eight of them, they didn't have any preference and two of them prefer to, to talk in English, but they understand very well Spanish, so it was not a problem. All the meetings were conducted in, in Spanish. Uh, they have an education of six to 25 years. So they, they really um, were educated, some of them in the US, and also all of them were coming from different uh, countries with the, the uh, complete education already. So were they born? Um, six of them, they were born in the US. Uh, the second group in the cab was uh, Mexico and five of them uh, born in Mexico and the other group were born in Guatemala. And, and you are going to see that these characteristics are also reflected in the, in the groups that we are running the SEPA prep uh, intervention. That, that's different from Miami, where more, more, the community is more Cuban and from Guatemala. We don't have anybody from, from Cuba. So what they do in the daily life, they work as um, different things. You know, we have three farm workers, two of them clean houses, uh, we have a, a licensed midwife, medical assistant. The important characteristic of this group is that all of them are affiliated to the community. So they are doing um, supporting community organization or community group or doing advocacy or going out to the, to the different farms to get advices. They are working now also in, in the getting more people vaccinated with the COVID. So what the, the CAP meeting are giving us information, as I was telling before, none of them were aware about PrEP. The other thing, when we present PrEP and we finish, they consider that PrEP is something that can women in the rural community will be interested for. They were also concerned about the lack of insurance they have. They asked question about exact, exactly how PrEP function and the side effect of PrEP. And I forgot to tell you that the one who ran the training was Dr. Castro. So all the answers were very, very clear, responded, and they love it. Uh, also, they asked question about PrEP in pregnancy contraindication of PrEP. They were also interested in PrEP in adoles adolescents if they can be used because one of the common was, uh, I don't know what to do with my adolescent children. They change partner weekly. So for her it was like, oh my gosh, this is something really good that we can use. And unfortunately the cultural factors, uh, particularly the machismo, is something that they discuss in deep, that machismo is still present in the community and is not going to, to change because there is um, a lot of immigration from Central America and Mexico. And they were telling us that these countries really have a strong uh, cultural um, values that they bring. So it's, it's difficult to to, to negotiate with them in relation to um, HIV prevention. Uh, also, they mentioned about the immigrants from Mexico and South America, that many of them, they don't know about HIV because this was never discussed in their country. So what happened with that is that condom is not something that they are aware and they don't know how to use or how to get. Also, they provide us a, a very good, um, information about how to modify SEPA prep to become it more easily to use with the women in the community. That was one part that's still ongoing. So also we have meetings with healthcare providers uh, and 
with one focus group of cisgender heterosexual women from the community. You know, um, and, and I know Dr. DeSantis is in the audience and he has been conducting these discussions with the healthcare provider. It has been super, super difficult that healthcare providers want to talk to us about PrEP because that was one of our main goals. So we have been doing the impossible to interview. We were, we have as a target six, six uh, people, but we would like to increase uh, a little bit more about that. So in, in that conversation and in the conversation with the 10 women, we found different barriers. The first one that they uh, told us is economic. If they don't have insurance, they know they, we, we told them that they can go to the Department of Health or other uh, programs. We also mentioned the uh, Miami different initiative that are there. So, but that was something that were concerned. Also, they were concerned about the delivery, how women who are interested can get them. We explained about the pharmacy and everything, but they, they continue concern. Also about the availability specifically in the home area where they're not physical places where they can go and, and get the, the prep. Also, they were concerned about how to create a network with the women so they can be informed and referral. Who is going to refer them to go and talk to a, to a physician to get the prescription? Also, they, they, they said that the barrier is that uh, Hispanic women, they don't know about PrEP and there are few healthcare providers that can provide this service in Homestead. So they need to go out of Homestead to try to find this type of service. Also, they mention again, stigma and rejection, still present related with HIV is not something that is already solved. And also continue the idea about sexuality as taboo. They're still not talking about um, taboo and sexuality among the women in the community or with their partners. As I mentioned to you, the culture that is, is continually strong, uh, making the power over men instead of, of women in sex, sexual decisions. Uh, religion also was uh, bring to the, the, the topic because they said that there are, they continue uh, being some churches that still oppose to condom use. And of course, not to pray because they don't know. Also, they identify that um, they saw some public uh, publicity campaigns that are best by prep, but for men. So they never put attention to it. And the language that many of the, the women in the rural area of Homestead, they don't speak English. So they really need more people who, who can talk to them uh, in Spanish. Facilitators they saw for the use of prep, Community resources, uh, they said there are still navigators and case managers that can be incorporated. They value also the existence of the mobile bank, bank that they have seen around. Uh, there are some uh, rural community and health organization that are providing uh, sex education and condom use. And they were suggesting the idea maybe to have something like telemedicine, for use uh, with PrEP. Also, they mentioned um, in terms of educational, educational programs target to women and more training for healthcare providers. So we'll not only focus to certain providers and also facilitators, community involvement, involvement and talking with community leaders and increase the advertisement for Hispanic women. Other facilitators that they, they, they think that was important was to offer different um, treatment to, to get the, the PrEP, uh, the oral, the injectable, and the vaginal ring. They were very open to the injectable. 
because they said that if they use oral, the, the partner will find out and they don't want it. They were not very happy with the vaginal ring. They were a little, like a little bit uh, afraid of using something that needs to be introduced in the vagina. And also they want to know exactly uh, a facilitator to have someone who follow up the use of breath. They also provide us with important information to make modification to SEPA into SEPA bread. So this, the modification or the cultural adaptation and content adaptation of the SEPA intervention, we receive the opinion of the CAB, CAB the um, healthcare providers, and the group of women who participate in the first focus group. We condensate all the suggestions that we receive to modify SEPA into SEPA prep. I'm not going to read all of them because they were a substantial uh, change in, in SEPA. We didn't modify uh, the mechanism of action, was more update the content and also incorporate SEPA prep from the beginning of SEPA, that is three sessions, to the last session. We present all these suggestions to the author of SEPA, that was um, Dr. Peragallo Montano. We met with her, we present each of the suggestions of the women, and she was very pleasant with the, the uh, content that we present to them to her. So in the reality, it was not a, a problem to, to start modifying the intervention. So the intervention now is composed of three sessions. Originally, when SEPA started, it was five sessions. But uh, in the last clinical trial, we modified to three sessions. We keep the session. We uh, maintain the name, we incorporate in the second session, ABC plus PrEP. And in the third session, we have communication and negotiation with the partner, prevention, uh, violence prevention uh, in the context of HIV. And we introduce a new, because women in the rural areas, they, they like the soap opera or teleserie and we modify the, the teleserial that we have in the original SEPA to introduce a new one that is updated and is very, very uh, oriented to the Hispanic culture. I think that that was a very good modification. In addition, when we had ready the SEPA prep, we trained three facilitators so they can be the ones who are going to meet with the cisgender Hispanic women in the rural areas and present the intervention. The, the training that we conduct was a eight hour, was face to face, and one of each facilitator is coming from the three organizations that are community organizations that are part of our study. So we have ready the intervention and we start presenting the intervention to uh, rural Hispanic women in the community. And we have uh, inclusion criteria of um, women be 18 to 49 years old, um, self-identify as Hispanic, heterosexual, and speak and read uh, Spanish, be HIV negative or unknown zero status, uh, having a sexual activity in the last six months and having a, at least one uh, risk factor, for example, more than one sexual partner, uh, unprotected sex or substance abuse during or having sex and having a smartphone or computer with internet connection reside in the rural area and able to consent. So we have recruited 38 women, 28 of them already finished the three session of SEPA. So we are collecting data for feasibility 
uh, an acceptability of the intervention. So women we have, they are 18 to 49 years old, and 22 of them are from Mexico, and 10 of them from Guatemala. So it's, 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 it's clear, at least in the area where we are in Homestead, that these are the, the majority uh, nationality of the people that participate in our study. And two of them born in the US. We have um, women living in the US uh, for one year to 31 years. Um, 37 prefer to speak in Spanish and only one in English. I don't know what's happened with the English word here, but the majority of them, they want Spanish. 16% are married, 16 or 16%. 28 are Catholic or Christian and they have an education of non-education to 20 years of education. So it's, it's, it's very, very heterogeneous, the, the group that we get in that sense. 26 of them, they don't have a health insurance and 22 of them are working. So they work in different uh, activities. I, this is in mix of Spanish and English. They work cleaning houses. Many of them work in the farm. Uh, they work also in nursery, in plant nurseries. Um, but that are the, the majority of the activities that they, they do. In terms of income, it, it, it uh, ranges for $400 per month to $4,000 per month. And also you can see that vary a lot how how many people live with this money through the month. So the, in the majority of them, um, they have um, not to, not a lot of people living with them, but the one that live with other people, we are talking about six, uh, six, four, five people living in the same place, which are also not very, very big spaces. So when we accept, uh, assess feasibility and acceptability, uh, 28 who already complete the, the intervention, they indicate, we ask for the degree of satisfaction with the information provided in SEPA, 28 of them were very satisfied and two of them, they were satisfied. Um, I forgot to tell you also that none of them have knowledge about PrEP, and this was the first time that they hear the, uh, the word PrEP. So, and they very anxious to know more and more. In the first session, when we start talking about PrEP, they were start asking a lot of questions, so we postpone a little bit the responses to the second session that is very strong a component of um, PrEP. Also, we asked about if they understood the information that we presented. Uh, they understood 12 of them. They very high understood, 13% uh, high, two neutral, and very low was one. We are suspecting that the lady who didn't have a previous education for her, was um, more difficult to hear uh, or to understand about the, the intervention. So that's something that we need to, to think in the future. And all of them are inclined to participate if we offer other programs like SEPA PrEP. Here, I'm not going to, to take time in this um, slide, but um, we ask specifically about each session what they, they like more about the, the session, what they didn't like, content that they would like to repeat or clarify, and other content. So this is very important for us in the final modifications that we are going to do with the, the separate. And you know, something that uh, is important that you know, um, because these sessions are face-to-face -face and participants want face-to-face. -face. So with the space distribution, they were not 
very happy with that. They want to be closer. They want to be more connected one to each other. But we were telling them that because the, the precaution that we need to be taken, that's not possible. So that was the space distribution that they were not um, satisfied. Other comment, uh, they were not happy because the prep was not over the counter. Uh, they were happy because we gave them a, con a female condom that also was the first time that they knew that the female condom uh, exists. So we, we gave to her a lot. One of the comments was mass repetition of information. We cleaned that because it was true in the first session. And so I can go on and on about what the suggestion provide to us. So we have a lot of to work. Oh, and the video called um, Sinvergüenza, they love it. They are really engaged. They see that uh, telenovela in the first session and bring a lot of topic like um, all the women who are having sexual activity that call the attention a lot also bring the, the information about men having sex with men, even though they have a female partner. So all of them bring a lot of conversation. So where, where we are now, we are going to reevaluate a separate prep based on the feedback provided by the, the participant of SEPA prep. And we are conducting also a focus group we select from the participant in the, when we are presenting SEPA, we select some women who talk more, who are more expressive to participate also in, in a focus group. So we go more in deep about the suggestion that they, they provide to us in order to, to modify SEPA prep. So we also need to develop the, the final version of the SEPA prep. And uh, uh, we updated the um, manual of the SEPA prep that is almost 200 uh, pages. We almost died doing that, but it's ready. Probably we need to return, but it's ready. And prepare final report and start doing presentation and publishing our, our results. We have um, references at the end, and thank you so much for for inviting us to this presentation. So let me stop sharing the screen. I don't know if I went too fast, but I was I had in mind twenty minute limit. I know no, I was, over that. This was good. Thank you so much, Rosina. This was really really great presentation to see. Um, are there any questions? And, and Dr. Alcaide, I have here a, a member from our team, Dr. De Santi. So if Dr. De Santi wants to add something because you were the one who has been working more with the healthcare providers. <clears throat> Thank you, Rosina. Yes, um, I would like to say that probably working with the healthcare providers has been more challenging than working with the participants. Um, <clears throat> we had, you know, a little difficulty uh, you know, recruiting people who would want to talk to us about this, because I think a lot of it is that they don't know about PrEP. Healthcare providers in the, in the rural communities don't know about PrEP, and they don't really know um, or feel comfortable. A lot of us have told them, told us that they don't feel comfortable doing PrEP. They want to leave that to the infectious diseases people. And one of the providers even said, listen, I know that PrEP is probably easier to manage than diabetes, but I would rather leave that with the professionals. And they consider like the ID people, the professionals to do, uh, to do the PrEP work. So I think that's probably been our, um, our you know, challenge getting healthcare providers. But what I think we learned the most here is that PrEP is just not available in the rural community. Um, it, for especially for women, and and like Dr. Cianelli said, um, healthcare providers still think that prep is for gay men, and they're not 
you know, a lot of them are not even aware or even up to date on the information for women. So that's kind of the challenges um, that we have. We, we will have 10 healthcare providers done by our deadline in December. Um, and I think we ha will have some really interesting uh, findings to report there also for a, for a, a presentation and for a paper. Mm. Dr. Alcaide, if, if I may also, there is also Dr. De Oliveira who participated especially in the adaptation of the first session about violence and um, communication with partner. I don't know, Dr. De Oliveira, if you want to say something about what has been done. <laughs> Yes. So basically, uh, you know, the third uh, chapter of the manual, of the SEPA manual, was talking about domestic violence, self-esteem, um, some of the coping skills, how to communicate with the partner. Uh, so a lot of these uh, mental health issues. And as an advanced practice nurse, a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, I was able to modify the content, which was well taken by the participants in the three organizations that we worked with. Um, you know, the main uh, topics were pretty much the same because the SEPA manual was developed in the 1990s. Um, <laughs> um, so over 20 yeah. years. So some of the concepts, the cycle of violence, you know, self-esteem were pretty much the same, but we had to update, um, you know, the numbers, basically the statistics and also give it a, the prep component, uh, prep focused when they talk to their partners, um, you know, with as, as far as the domestic violence and also uh, the coping skills. So it was very interesting to adapt that third chapter of the manual for me um, and see it in action, you know, and see it uh, being delivered by uh, the women from the community because we trained those three women from each one of the organizations and they were the ones who actually delivered the content. And I think it was the most difficult for, for them, uh, Dr. Elveira, to, to run that first session because the emotional component that it has. Yes, in fact, we had a, more than one woman, I believe, who told us about you know, domestic violence issues, um, even you know, more intimate issues with children, right? Uh, and it became very emotional. We had episodes when uh, they cried during the session. Um, so yes, we were there for them. Thank you. This is great. Thank you so much. I do have a question. Uh, so I saw the, um, the, the ages for, your, for the development of the program were some older women. Uh, up to I think I, I wrote up to up to 60 and they starting at 30 plus and uh, and then the but then your participants are 18 and older and I and my question is do you think that anything could change if this was really if, is this is this if this had been developed uh, with input from younger women I know they are hard to recruit and if and if older women sometimes I think the self perception about risk are not really matching the CDC recommendations for prep uh, for younger women may even be uh, more challenging. But I, I I wonder if you have any comments about that. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we have uh, some young women now when we are running the intervention. So they, they, are, they are providing very good uh, feedback. So I think that that, that, that your point is very, very important. We, we did not receive any, any comment yet that is not appropriate for them, since that they feel identified with, with the content. Something that one of the, the women comments, and is related with the age, was that during the the presentation of the telenovela that is, is very short, it's 20 minutes. There is a case of a woman, an abuelita, a grandmother who is having sex. So one of the participants said, well, if now all the women are having sex, why you limit us to 49 years old to participate in the program? And they were, we were like, well, you're right. Maybe in the future, we will make 
more adjustment and invite you to be part, invite you, are, because she wants to bring the, the, her grandmother. I want to bring my grandmother, but she's older than 49. No, she's, she's 50. Yeah, I'm a big. So there is a concern for older women. For young women, I didn't hear anything, only to, you know, now I remember that they were asking us to develop SEPA prep in a way that we can bring adolescents, girls with their mothers to participate in an intervention. Because they said that what they see at the school is they are not receiving uh, sex education and the, the adolescents are changing very, con not constant, but change frequently a uh, partner. There is no condom use, there is not education about HIV at the school, and they don't know about PrEP. So that was one suggestion in terms with uh, younger people, but coming with the mothers, because they said if we invite them, will be problematic to get the consent of some of the parents. So that was one suggestion. The other suggestion that was not related with age, they want that the partners participate in SEPA prep. And that was in all the groups they were asking, please, because these men are coming also from countries where they were not um, aware of HIV, they don't use condom, and they have a lot of machismo, um, cultural values that impede any type of condom use, plus domestic violence that was uh, prevalent also in the in the conversation they bring it. Uh, Rosina, and I think I think we can also share that um, we would like to adapt this also for transgender women mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we have a paper under review now about transgender women's experiences with HIV prevention, and you know some of the things that they talked about in that in that study um, really kind of fits in with uh, you know with the SEPA prep um, platform and. And, and all of that. They're, they're gonna be a little harder to uh, you know, recruit, but one of the things that they told us is they wanted more of this like internet technology. And so I think that this, this, this is gonna be some of our future work moving forward also. And, and Dr. DeSantis, that's very interesting because the women in Homestead, they want to be face to face and if they can be touching each other together, they prefer that. So that, that, that's, that's a, a different. Right. And also, I know that Dr. Oliveira presented a, a grant for, to, to Charm, where she's using also part of SEPA to implement something related with mental health. Dr. Oliveira, I'm, I'm right, no? Yes, mental health, uh, COVID-19, in the COVID-19 times. Yes, with SEPA, adding to SEPA prep, that is the mental health component. Yes, so hopefully, you know, if we uh, get these uh, funds, we can <laughs> run the study starting in March 2022. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? I mean, I guess it sounds, you know, this sounds amazing and it's great that you're doing this important uh, work here in Miami. Um, is there anything else that you feel like you need to um, learn before, you know, like I mean, the CIFAR Developmental Award Program is to get people to be able to submit for external funding? Like, are there more lessons learned that you feel you need to know um, to try to you know, take this, scale this, you know, up even more? Or do you feel like this, the pilot is good and you're, you know, kind of ready for the next step? Well, certainly we would like to pilot the, the, the intervention mm -hmm. uh, because in the reality we are not piloting in, we are just, because the grant didn't allow us to pilot the intervention to see if the pilot, if the intervention works works or not. 
So that certainly for us um, will be next next step. So we need to start uh, working in in that. Um, but the rest, I think we are very well informed about the community and how the community take the participation in this uh, study. You know, it, well, the, organi the, the community organization recruit the, the participants for the focus group. We only interview and we go to the session, but we are not recruiting them. So that's, that's important. And they didn't have problems to recruit them. They were very happy to come. And maybe, Steve, now that I'm thinking, we need to find out more about what's happening with men in the community. Because, thank you, Janelle, she has the, the thumb up. <laughs> because, you know, it has been across all the group that they want that we incorporate men. So, so I had an experience working with men in Chile for HIV prevention years ago. And you know, the most difficult was to bring the men to the intervention. Mm -hmm. So we were telling them how we are going to bring the men. And they said, well, we, we will be in charge of them, maybe not coming face to face, but we will be sure they will participate in an online version of the SEPA prep. And we will be with them for the last session. Not the entire, they don't want to be together, but they want to be, they, they said they needed more and more because they don't know. They don't receive this education from the countries where they are coming from. So that's, that's a big issue that we are, are seeing. Rosina and Joe, it was a great presentation. And I have to tell you, I remember when Nana Paragallo came and her, um, her introductory uh, presentation was the original CEPA. And what she said in that presentation, this was many years ago, has stuck with me. She said, you know, she did the women alone, but she knew and she learned from the women that the men were waiting for the women to come home and say, and, and asked, what did they say? What did they tell you? What did they teach you? And, and I know that you're, you're gearing this towards the, the um, at-risk women. And I think that the work is extraordinary, especially your focus group, your, your, you know, your, your group that's helping inform um, your model. But, um, and I know that it's an important group to look at the trans women as well. But we have, just in, in the PRIM clinics, in the prenatal immunology clinics, we have 100 women a year who are living with HIV. And um, they have partners. And, you know, we tried, we tried very hard. Um, we even wrote an R23 um, to try and get some funding to address PrEP for the partners of women who are living with HIV. When we survey the women, many of the men have not been tested um, or they've been tested and they're negative, but we know they're at risk. They're, they're, they're the baby daddies. They're not in a financial bracket where they're getting in vitro or creative ways to get pregnant. They're, the women are suppressed, but not all of them. They're coming into pregnancy with viral loads that are not undetectable. And Dr. Okaidi can certainly speak to that. So there is another group, Rosina and Joe, um, that perhaps you will consider building this intervention around. And that is the male partners of our women um, who are living with HIV. We need help in that area. Thank you. Yeah. If you, if you I, want to go that road, um, I have a mentee, well, she's now an associate professor, but at, at Mass General, who just finished a pilot study for men in South Africa with the main um, issue being, sorry, now, now she's at University of Alabama, uh, Lynn Matthews, who just finished, who, um, where the main issue is like wanting to conceive for individuals, uh, women living with HIV and how to deal with disclosure to the men and, and uh, bringing the men into the intervention. Yeah. 
One of the problems I had with our R23 is we couldn't convince them. And I have a colleague up in at UPenn who tried the same intervention. And we were both struck down because the, the reviewers weren't convinced that we actually could engage and have access to the male partners. So, um, you know, anybody who wants, poor Deborah, she's been hearing about this for years, <laughs> now, but it breaks my heart. Uh, Joe DeSantis and I did a, a small publication with 10 couples several mm -hmm. years back. Mm -hmm. And the extraordinary stories from the male partners of these women that we interviewed, no, no access to health care, no, you know, very stigmatized in terms of reaching out for information about HIV prevention. Um, and it's really heartbreaking. I think that they are an invisible group that could really benefit from something like this intervention that's geared a little bit towards the men. So something to think about. Yeah, okay. So I'll say the last yeah. words. Uh, because we are uh, uh, approaching end of the hour. I think it was a fantastic presentation. I want to thank you for it. I think the comments were really great, the interaction of all the participants. I also wanted to bring to your attention, you know, Mariano. I don't know if you know him. He's doing yes, Kanamori. with uh, his uh, Hispanic men. And, uh, uh, you know, I think you could also interact with him in these pursuit mm. of, of these crazy men that we want to be <laughs> involved in these studies so it might help there so Excellent. i think uh, that would be really a good link for you and John Al Al John Al yeah and John Al 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 Look, if, if you're having a problem with the reviewers in terms of doubting whether you can engage the male partners, then what you need to do, and, and I, I would think you've got the experience, you may even have the data, is publish it. In other words, describe it in, in written format, saying, you know, we've been doing this for X amount of months or years or what have you, and we've been able to actively recruit male partners into this program and if you if you publish it reviewers may change their mind yeah i i agree i think i think you'll get to the publications and uh you know follow this path so um again i think it was a uh, very eye-opening and educational and uh you should pursue the, the R21 path or something and uh, really go forward. Uh, and the mentorship program is here in the CFAR to help you with it.